Hey, video 4.3, we're going to look at economic indicators today. This would be any type of metric that's used to evaluate the entire economy. We're going to focus on three main ones. There are some others as well, but this is going to be our, our main focus here for the class is gross domestic product or GDP. We're going to look at unemployment. And we're going to look at inflation. We're going to go in depth on each of those three today. And then we're also going to take a minute to look at the business cycle and how that impacts the economy as well. So let's dive right in here. We're going to start with gross domestic product. Uh, this is a measure of economic output. So we're, what we're trying to do is try to look at all the goods and services produced in the country and determine how much is it worth. And, um, and so it's a total dollar value. In the United States, it's over $18 trillion on a year. Um, and we're going to look at what it includes, but we're going to start with what it doesn't include. So these terms here look at what, what are not included in terms of the GDP calculation. So we're going to run through these quickly. An intermediate good is a good that's used in the process of making another good. So when we would count something like, say, a car part, we're not going to include the car parts themselves and then the car as a whole. We're only going to count it once. So that would be an intermediate good would be a part. If you sold it as its own standalone good, then it would be a, it would be a good calculated in GDP. Um, um, likewise, that with a double counting, we don't include anything that's a secondhand sale. So if you buy a brand new car in 2016 and then you sell it in 2018, uh, it's counted in the 2016 year, but that sale in 2018 does not count towards GDP because nothing new was produced. We can't report any, count anything on black market sales just because they're not reported. Uh, there's it's a difficult um, it's difficult to get an accurate estimate of what is actually the, the transactions that are occurring in a black market. Um, non market sales, anything that is a service that's provided but there's no payment in exchange for it, is not going to be included in GDP. And then also government transfer payments. So any of the government programs that are paying out money to people with nothing really in return, uh, such as Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, unemployment, welfare programs like that, that's going to be included as transfer payments and not included in GDP. So what do we use GDP for? We're looking to compare. Uh, a current year to a previous year in the United States, for example, or we're looking to compare country to country. We're trying to examine growth and and look at how things are going differently from place to place. So some things come into play with that. Real GDP is a, is a nice way of comparing year to year because this takes inflation off the table. We see a rise in prices over time. Uh, so to compare, you know, 1960 to the present day is difficult to make happen. But if we have a metric that's measuring it based on inflation, we can see the actual growth that's occurred from 1960 to today. And GDP per capita is also an interesting metric because that's looking at the average output per person. Uh, so that's some in that's interesting when comparing country to country a lot of times because you can see what's the output per person that they're bringing out. Now, in terms of sectors of the economy, this is what we're actually going to count up when we measure GDP. What is the consumer spending that's occurring by in, from the households? What's the how are the markets doing? What's going on with investments? What's going on with government spending, not including those transfer payments? So what are we spending on military and roads and schools? Those are that's government spending that's included in that. And then foreign, uh, what we're looking at with the foreign spending is what's going on with our dollar value of our stuff that we're sending away in terms of exports and then the imports we're bringing in. So that's going to be a net exports type of thing. I'll show you in just a second. Uh, so in the calculation here, uh, you see that we're going to take consumer spending, investments, government spending and then net export. So that's the X minus M part there. We subtract those and we add that all together. That's going to make up our GDP. That's called the output expenditure model. Uh, and also here's a graph showing how real GDP and current GDP adjusts. So the blue line would represent 1960 to about 2006, uh, just not counting for any kind of price changes. So you can see the growth that's occurred. The red line shows when we take a base year of 2000, and we see that we don't get quite as much growth during that time because prices were rising gradually during that time as well. So the growth that's occurring is not quite as great as what we see. So this is nice at kind of really bringing home the reality of what's the growth that's occurred, kind of comparing years apples to apples. Now, unemployment will be our second metric that we're going to look at, second indicator. Uh, unemployment's kind of misunderstood. We're looking at what's the number of individuals that are unemployed divided by the entire labor force. We need to define labor force too, though. So anyone who's 16 or older um, who is either employed or seeking employment is considered part of the labor force. What's interesting is that anyone who cannot work is not considered unemployed. And anyone choosing not to work, say, for example, students, uh, are, are not considered part of the labor force, therefore not unemployed. 
so that's an interesting kind of misunderstood part of that, kind of a, a, a flaw of the system too, because it get, kind of gives a, a, a deceptive number. If there's a lot, if there's a large number of people that are not part of the labor force that should be. Um, another flaw with this is that it does not account for underemployment. So if you're working a part-time job, but with like full-time work, uh, but it's unavailable, it, we're still going to show up as completely employed. And that's a negative if that's happening in a large numbers. There are three types of unemployment. We're looking at structural, frictional, and cyclical. Structural and frictional are always going to exist. We're always going to have changes in the economy causing some jobs to become obsolete, new ones popping up in place of it. Uh, especially in, in the case of technology, that's structural unemployment. Frictional unemployment is when we're looking at a transitional unemployment. It's temporary. It's, it's we're, I'm moving from one place to another. I'm switching jobs within the same industry. Um, and I just want to get out of one place and into another. It's a temporary unemployment. Cyclical is what we want to avoid. This is based on recession. The economy, a slowing of the economy is causing people to get laid off and not be able to find new work to replace it. We want to avoid that as much as possible. Inflation is our third uh, indicator here. We're looking at the increased prices over time. Uh, this decreases the purchasing power of your money. The flip side of this would be deflation, which also would not be a positive. We'll get into that more uh, with fiscal and monetary policy. But um, demand pull inflation, there's two different types here. Demand pull would be when the demand for products is so great that we bid the prices up on, on consistent goods and services, whereas cost pushes when costs go up on businesses and they try to pass along their, their additional costs onto the consumer with higher prices to maintain their profit margins or just minimize damage. Uh, either way, we're going to see rising prices as a result. We tend to see inflation with any kind of growth. So that's, we tend to see, we'd rather see some inflation than deflation. Uh, okay, so in terms of the impact of this, lenders are gonna be hurt by inflation because they're not getting as much money back on the loans that they've already made out because the, their money's not worth as much anymore. Borrowers are helped though, because they got their money at a time when money was worth less, now it's worth more, uh, and they're paying the rates based on a previous loan date. Savers are hurt for the same reason as the lenders. Uh, and anyone with a fixed income that's not able to account for the additional costs that is not, they're not seeing higher wages with their, uh, with the increased costs, they're going to be hurt by this as well. Now, in terms of measuring this, we mainly are going to use a metric called the consumer price index, but there are others as well. But basically what's happening here is the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics looks at about 80,000 items, goods and services, and they are tracking the changes in prices over time and then looking at what's what's occurring there based on a number. All right, so that's the three indicators we're mainly focusing on, but we're also gonna take a look at the business cycle. All right, so with the business cycle here, there's a bunch of terms over here that you will need to know, but I'm gonna focus mainly on the graph over here. So what we see is that the blue line represents GDP. Uh, and what we, what we see happen is that over time, GDP is going to be growing. This is a period of expansion, followed by we, the point where we hit a peak uh, we top out and then we see a period of decline, also known as depression. And this period is referred to as a recession, a period of negative growth in the economy. Eventually we bottom out and we begin another expansion period until we hit another peak and begin to bo we bottom, out, we bottom out again at another trough and another uh, recession occurs. Uh, but all along the way, we want to see an upward trend. So this red line, we'd like to see consistent growth. So even though we have these peaks and valleys of the business cycle, we want to see consistent growth over time. Uh, and that's typically what we see, uh, at least in the United States economy with that. Uh, now, so there are some potential causes of this. Uh, we overinvest in periods of expansion. Uh, because we're expecting a higher return uh, than what really is going to happen because of it. sometimes there's people that get bit by, by a recession and they're not expecting it. Innovations that come along can create some really big short-term gains that cause some of that overinvestment. Uh, but then it, as firms begin to kind of catch on with these new methods or technologies, it kind of levels out. Uh, the, the Federal Reserve actually has some impact with this as well. We're going to talk more about that in Unit 5, though, so we'll leave that off for the moment. And then any external shock can cause, can cause fluctuations in the business cycle as well. So that's something we need to look out for as well, whether it's oil price changes or a conflict that we're involved in or not involved in. Uh, the, the bottom line is it's difficult to predict. It's easy to look back historically and say, like, how do we not notice that the housing market was about to crash? But it's harder than you think in the moment to decide where is that peak 
and we need to make a change. All right, that's going to wrap up this video on uh, economic indicators.